Today I want to talk about some things that have been rolling around in my mind. Um, hopefully you'll find it useful, I don't know, we'll see. The title, in case you're wondering, Brian, I have decided to be predestination or duration. Now, I'm going to explain what I mean by that. So we can start in Psalms 33, familiar verse, but good place to start. Psalms 33, 13, it says, The Lord looks from heaven and sees all the sons of men. From the place of his dwelling, he looks on all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashions their hearts individually, considers all their works. So when I consider this passage and I think about what that means or what that looks like, that God fashions all these hearts individually, uh, I think Dad put it pretty well last week when he was talking about how God can take you know, 10 inches of face or whatever it is and make them all different through billions and billions of people. Well, the hearts, I believe, are the same way. The hearts are... And, and understand what, you know, that's Bible talk, but it's the character of the person. It's the indwelling presence that makes them up. Their personality, character, all those things, that's all rolled into what is known as the heart of man. So when I consider that, I put it on a scale so I can better understand it. That's just how my mind works. So I, I ponder on it, and I think about... If you look at the world, look at all the people, and look at, in, in a sense, where they come from or their environment. So you see there's been cases where people have been in a, in a terrible environment, terrible circumstances, and somehow they just rise above it all and they become successful and confident and strong, you know, very productive people. But then you also see the, the other side, and that's what I do. I like to set the extremes and then bring it in. You see the other side where a person can have the best possible opportunity and environment anyone could have, and they completely go the opposite way. Well, the only thing then I can conclude when I think about that, and you know, fill in the blank, we all know people like that, we can all say, yeah, I know this person, they were like that, and, and it's, it's us, it's me, it's all of us, we all fit into those, you take those two extremes, you start bringing it in, and everybody fits in there somewhere to some degree, and it can only be because of this right here, because God's made us all different, he's made us all different. So then when you talk about some of these predestination ideas, if you were to stop right there, I can see the argument. I can see where they're coming from. Whether it's uh, Romans 8 and 29 about how whom God he foreknew, he predestined, be conformed to the image of the Son. People could very easily make the argument that, see, you're either just born with the right kind of heart to be an overcomer or you're not. There's nothing you can do about it. It's just happenstance and chance. Or some believe that it's just been predetermined. God's going to save so many people, and it really doesn't matter what you do. He's already got it figured out who he's going to save. You know, those, those ideas are out there. People think that way. And like I said, if we just stopped right there, I'd say, well, you know what? I guess that's pretty true because it's obviously not the environment that determines who the person's going to be because like I just said we've seen people from both ends of the spectrum go the the opposite way so obviously that's not it so then it has to be you're just simply born with the right kind of character heart you know the personality or you're not we well, see what I want to talk about here today is regardless of these observations is the information good? Is the information that God gives us working the plan? Because, you know, you know, speaking of Romans 8, 29, we understand that to mean that it's the plan that's predetermined, not the individual, and we'll get there in a minute. So that, that makes it a little different, and, and we'll, we'll talk about that. We'll explain it. But is the information good? Is this going to work on the person no matter where they come from? 
no matter what kind of personality or, or heart they have? And I believe the answer is yes. Now, you know, here, here's something, too, that I don't want to talk about, but I'm at least going to mention it, because going with what I'm saying about the information, you think about Proverbs 22, 6, okay? God says, train up the child in the way they should go, and when they're old, they won't depart from it. And I've talked about this before, and I'm not going to go into it today. But is the information good? Is that a promise from God? And the answer is yes. But you say, how can that be? Because you just said people can go from the best environments and go completely opposite ways, and we all know people like that, so we all know it's true. So how is that possible? Well, like I said, I've talked about it before. I ain't going to talk about it today. But what, there, what is being referred to in that verse is that it is the way that will not depart from them. When it says they will not depart from it, it is referring to the way. It's the knowledge that you've given them. So here's the thing. This isn't just, well, the environment doesn't matter, so it doesn't matter what I do, so I'm just not going to do anything. No, we all need to do the best we can. And the best we can is doing it, and I keep saying it, I guess I should tell you what I'm talking about, raising children, okay? We're not going to dwell on it, but, you know, we all raise children, you know, one way or another, form or fashion. So we should, of course, go by the way God says we should do it because that's the best way, that's the right way. We want to give them the best possible uh, you know, chance we can, so that's what we should do. But does that mean that that now reigns supreme over free will? No, it does not. So then when we talk about Proverbs 22, 6, and he says that they will not depart from it, the knowledge of the way, the knowledge of God, the knowledge of there is a path to salvation, there is a way to eternal life, it's the knowledge of that that will not depart from them. They may very well choose to deny it or reject it, because that's their free will. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I want you to understand with that. So we should do the best we can. We should do all we can the right way, the way God says to. But we're not going to bind. I'm not going to bind heavy burdens on people <clears throat> that ain't theirs to carry. But the information is good. So, we'll move on to Romans 8 and 29. Whom God he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. Now, we believe that to be the plan, not the person, because the person is whosoever will. Okay, uh, 2 Peter 3, 9, okay, uh, to, that goes along with that. God's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. So the Bible is our instruction manual to salvation and eternal life, that we need to be fully convinced that that information is good, despite and apart from our observations or our experiences. I'll just throw this little... Uh, experience in for you so you kind of get what I'm saying. I'll try to do it quickly. Uh, you know, the other day I had to replace a, a part on my truck, so I thought, well, you know, while I'm in there, I'll just throw a mild lift kit on it because, you know, I just can't help myself. <laughs> Figured it'd be no problem. I've done it before on an older model. I didn't realize how much technology had changed from what I used to work on to what I have now. And about 10 hours later, I am sweating, bleeding, and just about had enough. And I am staring at this instruction manual thinking, these guys don't know what they're talking about. It's just this little thing that goes on top of the strut, but everything has to come out for that thing to go in there. And the spring has to turn, and the spring would not turn. So I'm thinking, all right. So if I torch this off and weld this on, and I'm thinking, no, no, don't, that's, that's the wrong idea. But I had to believe that the information was right. 
So I kept trying, and I kept failing, and I kept trying, and I kept failing. I was just about ready to put it back in the box and put it on the shelf, and I said, one more time. And I grabbed that pry bar, and one more time, the and <laughs> the spring turned. That's all I needed. Once I knew I could do it, I got it done. But I had to be convinced that the information was good. What I was doing was the right thing to do, even though I kept failing at it. Our walk is no different. We need to stick to the plan. Even if it doesn't seem to be working, we have to be convinced, we have to believe that the information is good and it's right, and we got to just give it another try. So, what's God going to do about all these different heart conditions that some have their uh, good traits, and we also have our bad traits. God's got to work all that out because he wants unity. He wants conformity, conform to the image of his son. That's what 829 says. So how's he going to do that? What's the solution? Well, you see it in Ezekiel 36. See, this is where all that predestination stuff starts to fall apart. why it's good to take all the information add add it all up so Ezekiel 36 and 26 uh, 20 yeah 26 I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you I'll take the heart of stone out of your flesh and, and give you a heart of flesh I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them so, why is baptism important? Why is it important to do things the way God says you need to do it? Because it's the only way this process works, because you need a new heart. You need a new spirit. What does that mean, then? That means that through that, people who were unloving can be loving. People who didn't have mercy they can now have mercy, so on and so forth, making us all acceptable to the Lord. Takes all those quirks, all those individualnesses, and unifies them. Okay, well, so what's, what does that look like? What does that take? What does it take to change a heart, to change a personality, a character of a person? That's, uh, that's pretty serious, right? You probably need a college degree, you know, some things like that. Well, no. You need to be willing. You need to desire the change to happen. You need to be steadfast in the Word and the Spirit. And most importantly, you need to have eyes open to every situation. What is this bringing out? in me most importantly let me tell you why <clears throat> it's real easy okay Lord we'll do it your way I think I'll work on this I can work on that I'll work on a few other things I'm going to pick things that aren't too uncomfortable that aren't too bad but man, am I ready to pick Jesus a fight every time I see somebody else doing something they shouldn't be doing. Man, you get blinders on. It's like tunnel vision. You're so ready to bring everybody else's business out in the open. You don't stop to consider yourself. Especially in relationships. If you would just do this, if you would just change that, if you would just stop it, don't you see how crazy you're making me? Don't you see you're ruining everything? But what if God's saying that to me? You know, that, that right there is where a lot of people walk away. That right there can be the end. If you're not in it to fix you, then don't bother. If you just want to fix everybody else, don't bother. 
This is about you. It's about me. As painful as that may be, which brings me to the next point. Never underestimate the hardness of the way. That's where the duration part comes in. Now this word <laughs> has significant meaning to me. And that's why I wanted to talk about it, because it really is perfect for this situation. See, this was a saying me and my buddies used to have back in our wilder days. Guys would hear about our escapades and crazy stories, and they'd show up, and, you know, I want to go with you guys. You know, I want to ride with you guys. And my buddy there, he'd look them dead in the eye, just as serious can be, and say, listen, if you get in that truck, you're in this thing for the duration. Because there have been times people would find out they're in over their head and panic. So he started making it real clear. If you're in it, you're in it for the duration means it you're in it till it's over you're you're riding this thing till the wheels fall off there's no quitting at halftime and some of us would just kind of grin you know people would be like yeah yeah okay yeah I mean, like they got no idea what they're getting themselves into well <laughs> christians do you have any idea what you were getting yourself into when you went in them waters of baptism, yeah, I want to be healed. Yeah, I want to be saved. I want to give my life to the Lord. Oh, really? Yeah, no idea where that's going to take you. You're in it for the duration. You know, I think Peter said it perfectly. John 6, 68, when Jesus said, well, where are you, are you guys going to leave also? And you know, he's talking about some things and didn't make sense and Peter says where are we going to go you have the words to eternal life see when he said that he's saying good days are bad sunshine or rain there's no other option we're in this thing with you to the end we're riding this train to the grave take a lesson from Israel while we're at it and while we're talking about the hardness of the way before we uh, continue on with the duration, let's let's talk about Israel. Uh, look at uh, Numbers 14. Now we we know the story. I won't spend a lot of time on it. Got they were enslaved in Egypt, crying out to God to be saved. So He saves them. He takes them out. And then the hardness of the way started getting to them. Numbers 14 and 2 says, All the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, If only we died in the land of Egypt, if only we died in this wilderness, why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and children should become victims. Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to another, Let us select a leader and return to Egypt. See, sometimes in that duration, the hardness of the way starts to get to you and you start misremembering what you left behind and what, what you came from. See, they're not thinking about the taskmaster's whip. They're thinking about the houses. Or if you want to go back and look about when they were complaining about the manna and they want some meat. Talk about, oh, well, the meat we had in Egypt so they get quail till it's coming out their eyeballs. They're starting to misremember because of the hardness of the way. Now all of a sudden what's back there actually looks easier and looks better than this. Well, why is that? Because they were able to just kind of pick and choose what they wanted to take care of and work on or because they were getting forced through something that was making them uncomfortable. Well, we know how that worked out for them. They died in that wilderness. We don't want to be that. So where are we going to go? See, it's not a predetermined outcome. It's not only certain hearts that has what it takes. God has given us the instruction to install the new heart and the new spirit that will make us acceptable if we choose it. You know why this word duration is so perfect for this? 
because it's a big fat question mark. How long is it going to be? Don't know. Well, how bad is it? Don't know. You know, on every person's individual level, don't know. Well, well is it going to get weird? I don't like weird. Yeah, probably, but I don't know. You're in it for the duration. Are you in or are you out? Make up your mind, yes or no. See, that's that kind of level of commitment that you got to have if you're going to go through this process. Jesus talked the same way. He's telling people the same thing. You want to sit at my table? You want to carry my cross? You want to be in this with me? You don't even know what you're asking for. Luke uh, 14 uh, 27, verse 27, Luke, Luke 14. He's telling them, consider the cost of the tower. Luke 14, 27, Jesus says, and Whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Lest after he's laid the foundation and is not able to finish it all who see it will begin to mock him saying this man began to build and he was not able to finish don't just come in this thing looking to build a foundation we're going to put a foundation in we're going to build a house we're going to put the white picket fence out by the road with the mailbox and the rose bushes we're in it for the duration there ain't no quitting at half time and if you're not and don't waste your time. So, having said that, let me say this. It's best to leave all our preconceived notions and better ideas behind. Because where we're going, we're not going to need them. And they will not help us. It will actually hurt us. Because just like I mentioned a minute ago... You know, especially with relationships, you'll be so focused on what you think and what you're looking to accomplish or what somebody else needs to change, you're going to miss what's right in front of your face and what God is trying to show you. Leave it behind. I got a few minutes. I'm going to tell you another story. So you all know last spring I bought a semi-truck, right? Well, before that happened, oh, man, I'm going to do this right. Lord, <laughs> praying, sleepless nights, praying, Lord, just tell me what you want me to do. You know, Because, you know, if you're going to ask of the Lord, you got to do it the right way, and you got to go in accordance with his will. I know all that. I believe it. I agree with it. I accept it. So, Lord, should I stay where I'm at? Should I get my own truck? What would you like me to do? You just tell me what to do, and I'll do it. I just want a clear answer. That's what I said. Well, I found a truck. It was affordable. I bought it. A couple months later, a global pandemic sets in. Hmm. All right. So she sits in the driveway for a while, and, you know, things... Life's changing, things are happening, things are going on, and I'm, I'm kind of sweating. I don't, mean, I don't know what's going on here. I don't know what to make of this. I don't know what to do. Sleepless nights, oh my goodness, and what to do, what to do. So finally, I, I say forget it. All right, you know what, I'm just going to stay where I'm at, sell the thing. Then some things happened after that. Some jobs came through and stuff, and I was like, man, maybe I should have kept it. But then... You know, what happened was I kind of got a little ticked off about the thing, okay? I didn't handle it very well, because I'm like, Lord, what are you, are you playing games with me? What is this? What's going on? But the more I thought about it, the more I still think about it, what I asked for, I asked for an answer, a clear answer. Well, in that year of all this turmoil I learned so many lessons that I wasn't even looking to learn did God give me a clear answer yes he did did he give it to me the way I expected it or the way I wanted it the way I was preconceiving it was going to happen absolutely not 
But did he do exactly what he said he'd do? Yep, he sure did. So I got to accept it. And I, I am. I'm accepting it. I'm fine with it. But I want to share that with you because I want you to understand just how serious this can be. Because, you know, when we're sitting here in the, in the building and we're talking about these things, it's easy to say, yeah, 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 you know. Well, when you don't know the end and you're going through it and you're not sure how this is going to play out, it can get real tough. It can get real tough. And again, that can be one of those times where people just say, you know what, I don't know what's going on, but I don't like it, and I'm done with it. It was recently brought to my remembrance that we kind of have an example of how the Lord likes to work in our lives. Thank you, Mother. <laughs> don't forget good old Judas Iscariot. Walked with the Lord, chosen by the Lord. He had a problem. He had a money problem. So Jesus said, hey, why don't you hang on to the money box? Well, why did he do that? Picking on him? Wanted to laugh and point? Nope. He says, we ain't going to pretend that this problem ain't here. We're going to face it. So here you go. I'm giving you the opportunity to face your problems and to overcome them. And you can do it. And if you don't, you'd be hanging by a rope outside the city. It's just that serious. So if we're in this thing, then we're in it for the duration. Whatever that is. However long it goes. No matter where it takes us. All preconceived notions and better ideas can be left at the curb. The Lord knows what he's doing. We either trust him or we don't. We believe this information is good, even if just like that spring I was trying to turn, try for hours and it don't work, try it one more time. And then if that don't work, try it another time. Trust the information. It will do what it's designed to do. We got to see it through. So, thank you for your attention this morning.